Now there is a new report from Oxfam International that shows that the level of income inequality worldwide has hit drastic new levels. According to this report, just 62 people worldwide last year held the same amount of wealth as the 3.5 billion people who make up the bottom 50% of the world. Holy shit. In a report by last year, in comparison, 80 people had as much wealth as the bottom half. In 2014, the figure was 85, and in 2010, it was 388. Notice the trend. It seems that a larger and larger concentration of wealth is going to a much smaller and smaller group of people. That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. Now, I guess there are people out there who will say, what are you talking about? It's a great thing. How? It's not like that wealth's going to trickle down on you. It's not. I mean, there's been something trickling down, but it ain't well. I mean, and the whole idea that you stuff the rich so full that their cup overflows and you catch what rains down on you is such a ridiculous idea in the first place. I don't know how anybody could even believe in such a system, but th that's just me. Now, anyway, according to Nick Galasso, a senior researcher at Oxfam America, he says it's irrefutable that there is extreme wealth inequality in the world. Oh, of course. And to be honest, we've, we've always had a large degree of income inequality in the world. However, what's different and what's alarming, according to Nick Galasso, says that this trend as I've shown you, continues to get worse and worse. How bad is it? Well, according to the report, the top 1% of the world's population control more wealth than the rest of the world combined. Last year, the average wealth of each of the 72 million adults belonging to the richest 1%, now remember, this is worldwide. This is worldwide. Like 72 million in America, okay, pretty, pretty big chunk, right? Pretty big chunk. However, however, worldwide, we have 6 billion people. 72 million adults that belong to the richest 1%, well, their wealth was 1.7 million. Let's compare that. 1.7 million compared to the 5,000 for the 648 million people in the bottom 90%. Jesus, that's a lot. Now, there's a separate report published last year by Pew Research Center that found that poverty worldwide, there's some good news. Poverty worldwide has fallen by nearly half over the past decade, right? Still, 71% of the world's population remain low income or poor, which means they live about, they live off of about less than $10 a day, many of them under a dollar a day. That's a disaster. And I know, you know, different scales of economies, of course, but now we're, we're, we're now a global economy, right? We're a global community. That kind of means that, well, the lowest of, them, uh, lowest of us are connected to the richest of us now through economic means, through trade, etc. And low wages in one country, since we are global, means that a lot of our companies will now go to exploit the low wages and low work, uh, working conditions, the terrible working conditions, and the socioeconomic status of, this, of these low wage countries, of these standard of living countries that have a, a very, very low standard of living. It's not a good situation. It's not a good situation. What we should be working for is a global middle class. Just like what happened in America, we had a big middle class. And the country and the rich was very prosperous. And it brought a lot of good things. We should be going for a global middle class. Now, according to that, Pew calls that more po promise than reality. 
Now, while the middle class has nearly doubled over the decade to 13% in 2011, it still represents a very small fraction of the world's population. Most of humanity lives in poverty and absolute destitution. That should not be something that we should accept. It is unacceptable. It should be, there's something should be done. The Oxfam report said power and privilege is being used to skew the economic system to increase the, gra the gap between the richest and the rest. The fight against poverty will not be won until the inequality crisis is tackled. Now, how are they going to do that? What are they calling for? Well, Oxfam calls for global leaders to crack down on tax havens, where the rich have stored about $7.6 trillion, according to estimates. Like they go to places like Ireland. They go to places like the Cayman Islands and the Bermuda, right? The islands of Bermuda. And they stick their money in shell corporations. They don't even have to live there. They just have a mailbox. There, there is a place on the Cayman Islands, a house that has mailboxes that belong to many of the different largest corporations in the United States and all over the world. And all these mailboxes are basically so that corporations can use loopholes and special rules to claim that their headquarters or, uh, you know, stuff like that is, is located in the Cayman Islands, that their addresses are there so that they don't have to pay taxes to the American government for doing business in America and, of course, using American assets, American infrastructure. They're literally stealing from our pockets. And what they don't pay in taxes, we make up for. Other things that Oxfam is, is calling for. Pay workers a living wage. Protect workers' rights to unionize and the gender pay gap. And promote equal inheritance and land rights for women. Now, I wish they would kind of get into more detail about the pay gap. Because there are reasons for it. Um, and it's a bit of a misleading statistic. But nonetheless... All these different things are great things to call for. Not only that, but you have to minimize the power of big business and lobbying on government. That's the big one. You handle the issue of money in politics. You can handle other issues afterwards. Now also, you have to shift the tax uh, burden away from labor and consumption towards wealth and capital gains, and use the public spending to tackle things like inequality. I would much prefer these uh, suggestions, I would much prefer this than the historical precedent to some of the different emerging middle classes that we've had historically. Uh, for example, uh, Europe had a little thing called the Black Death. Not a great thing. Killed a lot of people. Uh, turns out it even killed rich people. See, it didn't exactly discriminate versus class. Okay, it killed everyone. Millions of people. Well, that ended up freeing up wealth and power and actually led to one of the first merchant classes in Europe. Then we go to France and the French Revolution. We all know what happened there. Oh, let them eat cake? Didn't work out so well. I don't want that. I'm not saying I want that. Actually, I want us to avoid that. And America has avoided that before. For example, FDR and the New Deal are a great example of combating income inequality and the top 1% taking just about everything. He took on the rich. He took on the corporations. He created the New Deal. And it did a lot, but it didn't go far enough. That and the money and interest, of course, found a way to get around some of those things. And they did so by being able to legally purchase our politicians and corrupt the government. What we need is a new, new deal. If America could become a leader on combating income inequality at home, then it could also be a good example of how to do it globally. But we have to fix things at home first. We have to get the uh, 
money out of politics, the corrupting influence of campaign finance out of Washington. You have to have publicly funded elections. You have to get rid of Citizens United. You have to get rid of McCutcheon. And finally, you have to, you have to, to say that money does not equal speech because it isn't. It's not speech. It's not free speech for America if everyone doesn't have it. And in America, if you have money, you have free speech. If you have more money than someone else, you have more free speech. And that is not right, and that is not American.